you have two choices. You can eat a marshmallow now or wait 15 minutes and get two marshmallows. This was a question posed to young children in a famous study at Stanford University a few decades ago. Now, the purpose of the study was to understand delayed gratification, the ability to wait and resist a temptation for a later reward. Now, it turns out one of the key differences between the children who ate the marshmallow and the children who waited was due to the amount of activity in the frontal lobe, specifically the prefrontal cortex. And in this video, we're going to touch on the prefrontal cortex and examine the power it has over the decisions we make in our life, like my current decision to stuff my face with these marshmallows. All right, guys, welcome to Psych Explained. In this video, we're going to examine the frontal lobe. Now, if you're trying to identify where the frontal lobe is located, let's say on a diagram like this, there's really two things I want you to think about. The first one is the fact that it's called the frontal lobe, which should tell you that it's in the front of our cerebrum, located right behind the forehead. And the other one is the fact that it's the largest of the four lobes of the cerebral cortex, making up almost a third of the surface area of the hemispheres. Now, there are also boundaries. We have divisions here and here that also help us divide the lobes. For example, this one called the lateral sulcus divides the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe. And remember, sulcus meaning groove. And we also have one up here called the central sulcus that runs along the top of the head that separates the frontal lobe from the prior lobe. And of course, we have the occipital lobe located in the back. So whether it's the size of the frontal lobe or the name frontal lobe or the boundaries, it's easier to identify. Now in this video, we're going to identify four main parts or systems that exist within the frontal lobe. And even though each part has a separate function, what really brings them all together is they showcase how important this area is in everyday life. Whether it's speaking or moving your muscles or controlling your muscles, the frontal lobe is really vital to everyday behavior. So the first thing we're going to do is identify where those parts are located, and then we'll dive into each one. Now, the first one is called the primary, primary motor cortex. Primary motor cortex. Now, where can we find this on the frontal lobe? Well, it's going to be located in the back of the frontal lobe, just in front of the central sulcus. And it's this little strip that runs down the hemisphere and we can label it right here. And this plays a role in motor control or movement. And we'll dive into that in a few moments. What's another part? Another part we are gonna label as the Broca's area. The Broca's area. And this is located also in the back of the frontal lobe. That's gonna identify by this little circle right here. And what this lets us know is that the frontal lobe plays a role in language. And we'll talk about that as well. The third part, is what we're going to call the prefrontal, prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is located at the front of the frontal lobe. It's going to make up this area right here. And the prefrontal cortex controls what we'll say and label as executive functions. We'll dive into that as well. And the fourth is not necessarily part, but more of a system or pathway that we call the dopamine pathway. Dopamine being one of the main neurotransmitters in our brain. And this pathway is going to begin right above our brainstem, and it's going to travel through the frontal lobe as well. And we'll talk about its function in reward-seeking behavior as well. So there's our three parts or systems. We have our primary motor cortex, Broca's area, prefrontal cortex, and our dopamine pathway. So let's start up here with our primary motor cortex. Now, if you want to move your muscles, right? You have a thought in your head. I want to move my arm. Well, something has to execute that thought, and that would be our primary motor cortex. So what does it do? It controls voluntary, voluntary movements. Movements. So let's actually break this apart, okay? Imagine for a moment that you're lifting weights, okay, as I drew here. Well, first you have to have a thought, right, that I want to lift the weight, right, that might take place in the cortex. But then you also have to feel the dumbbell, right? In other words, you have to take in information. 
about the shape of the dumbbell and the weight of the dumbbell and the texture of it, right? And that's gonna go to our somatosensory cortex located right behind or posterior to the central sulcus. But then that's gonna relay a message to the primary motor cortex, right? We can label this as well, to execute that action, right? Now we actually have to move our muscle to lift the weight. And this is gonna carry impulses, we can call these motor neurons or effort neurons, down the brain through the thalamus, as it carries this way, down the brainstem through the central nervous system. And that's gonna to go to our peripheral nervous system and control our muscles to move our fingers, right? To move our wrists, to move our arms. This is gonna carry out and execute all the movements in the body. So we take in information and then we send impulses away. So that's the first part about the frontal lobe, our primary motor cortex. Now our second part is what we're gonna label as the Broca's area, okay? That's gonna be located more in the back of our frontal lobe. And you remember what I said its function was at the beginning? Language, okay? Now specifically, what part of language? What we're gonna say is speech production, okay? Producing speech. Now this area was discovered by Pierre Paul Broca in the 1800s, who was a French physician. And the reason this is important is because he observed patients with damage or lesions to this area. And at the same time, they also had issues with speech. So that was letting him make a connection between speech and this area of the brain, which eventually became named after him. Now, what do I mean by speech production? The ability to move the muscles in my mouth to speak, right? In other words, it's not necessarily influencing the words I say, but the mechanism to speak. So we have all these different pathways and nerves stemming from the brainstem and the central nervous system. And these are gonna control things like my facial nerves, facial nerves, and my tongue. And if you think about how difficult it would be to talk without my tongue or as facial nerves, it would be really difficult because they let me articulate and, and move my mouth and be fluid. So that is why the Broca's area plays a big role. Now the Broca's area also communicates with an area in the back of the temporal lobe called the, the Wernicke's area. Okay, the Wernicke's area. Okay. Now the Wernicke's area plays a role not necessarily in speech production, but speech comprehension, right? So as you're understanding what I'm saying, this is also kind of communicating, if I use a different marker, with our Broca's area to let us know what's going on, right? So we have kind of two parts communicating together. Now, if there's damage in this area, damage in the Broca's area, what could that lead to? This could lead to what we call Broca's, Broca's, aphasia. Broca's aphasia. And this might be damage or issues with fluency, being able to talk fluidly, or grammar. So there are issues if you damage this area as well. All right, so our third one represents our prefrontal cortex. And we can actually draw that right here, which is in the front of our frontal lobe. Now, I said in the introduction, this controls what we call executive functioning or executive actions. In other words, this is really where a lot of cognitive processes occur that make us so intelligent. Whether it's decision making or planning or organizing, this is really the seat of intelligence. So let's break down what the prefrontal cortex plays a role in. The first one is what we're gonna say, generally speaking, as thinking. Now, thinking occurs across the cortex. We're talking about decision making and planning and organizing, right? That's kind of the executive functions that we are referring to. The prefrontal cortex also plays a role in personality. personality. Being able to manage my emotions, being able to control my impulses. As we talked about in the beginning, the famous marshmallow experiment, right? My ability to wait and resist the temptation. This really takes place in my prefrontal cortex. And we stated before, kids who were able to wait showed more activity in this area than kids who couldn't wait. So that was a nice connection to our beginning. Other functions we know plays a role in learning. We know it plays a role in what we call working memory. Our ability to not only store information, but also use it, right? If you're solving a math problem, you have to store that information as you're solving the problem. And then lastly, plays a role in selective attention. 
okay, my ability to pay attention. And focus on whatever it is you're focused on. So we have thinking and personality, learning, working memory, and attention. Now, what happens if there's dysfunction in this area, okay? Well, if you think about symptoms, right? Lack of attention, lack of impulse control. A lot of this sounds very similar to attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or what we'll just abbreviate as ADHD. And this is where we think this stems from, right? The lack of impulse control and the inability to pay attention, right? This is the area where we might see some of that dysfunction. All right, so what's last? We have our dopamine pathway. Now the dopamine pathway is not a specific part, but more of kind of a neurotransmitter highway for dopamine that travels throughout the brain. But let's tackle dopamine for a second. Dopamine is one of the main neurotransmitters in the brain. And it's involved in behavior and thinking and motor control and even pleasure. And pleasure is really what we're referring to in this one. In other words, do you ever have a feeling to eat that sugary snack, to pick up your cell phone, to hang out with friends, right? That's really that dopamine that is motivating you to do those behaviors. So the dopamine pathway is what we're referring to as our reward, reward seeking behavior, okay? A reward seeking behavior, okay? In other words, if we're thinking about what are the things that dopamine helps us do or we find pleasure in to make us do it again, it could be things like eating, right? Eating something sugary and we want to, you know, eat it again. Or whether it's something like, you know, checking our phone, right? Checking social media over and over and over again. Or it could be something like gambling, right? That could be something that we want to go back to over and over and over again. Or it could even be something as basic as hanging out with friends, right? Or as severe as something as an addiction. In other words, any type of behavior that feels good and you want to do it again and again and again, the dopamine pathway plays a role, right? That's the reward seeking behavior, right? We might think of like a slot machine where if you win, you're going to do it again and again and again. Now, where does this dopamine actually play a role when it comes to the frontal lobe? Well, a lot of the dopamine neurons, right, the neurons that release dopamine, these axons start within the midbrain, right, that's right above the brainstem, and these travel through the frontal lobe and the prefrontal cortex. Now, there's several pathways, but this is one of the major ones, right? So all this dopamine is going to be released within the frontal lobe and the prefrontal cortex, right? So this would be one of our major dopamine pathways. Now, if there's any dysfunction in this area, right, if something goes wrong, this could lead to things like schizophrenia. So there are, you know, specific disorders associated with the dopamine pathway as well. Now, it's also important to know that the dopamine pathway interacts with other parts of your brain. For example, it might interact with your hippocampus, okay, our hippocampus, and our hippocampus controls, hippocampus controls memory, or our amygdala, okay, which controls more emotions. Amygdala. In other words, imagine you're checking your phone, right, and you're on social media. Well, you have that boost of dopamine, you have an interaction with your hippocampus, which controls memory, right, processing memories, you're remembering this feels good. It's affecting your emotions, right, it feels good and you feel joy checking it, and then you got that boost of dopamine to pay attention, right, so you're remembering it feels good, uh, the emotions feel good, you're being able to focus on your phone. So the dopamine pathway also interacts with other parts of your brain as well. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe, comment below, and I'll see you next time.